Good evening, everybody. Hi. Uh, uh, you may be wondering why I'm here, but um, my name is Charles Carpenter. I'm the former AIGA Colorado president. And if you're wondering where Alicia is, she's across the pond getting inspiration, probably in a cafe in Paris right now. So don't feel too bad for her. Uh, she's doing OK. Um, welcome. Um, tonight, if you walked in, you probably hopefully picked up one of these. If not, pick one up on your way out. Uh, it lists our events for fall, and it's pretty exciting what uh, the board has come up with uh, for you guys. Um, two things I wanted to kind of call out on that. Obviously, uh, Bordobello coming up October 6th. Um, I was able to um, see some of the boards uh, while they were getting curated, and um, there's over 300. It's our biggest event, I mean, the most boards we've ever had, and there's some stunning work. It's really cool. Not to mention, one of the boards, which just we just got today, uh, is this one, designed by our speaker tonight. And he graciously uh, gave his autograph, so it's the only autographed Charles S. Anderson board in the country right here tonight. And uh, you can see this board in person and bid on it October 6th at Redline. So uh, come out for that. It'll be, it's our signature event as a chapter. It's a lot of fun, as you know. So. Um, uh, what is it, 6 to 9, I guess, is when it's going to be. Um, also, our next speaker coming up is Alyssa Walker um, on November 8th. And um, there's a bunch of other events. Just go on to the newly designed, finally, AIGAColorado.org, and you can find um, some events. Um, Julie, our membership director, she uh, wanted me to mention that tomorrow, uh, if you go to AIGA.org, there's a free webinar. You need to sign up for it on Branding ABC. And um, what's cool about this is if you sign up for this, you can also download it and, and watch it later if you don't have time to watch it. But it, it's tomorrow at noon um, or noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. So I don't know, whenever that is, mountain time. <laughs> uh, so before I introduce our speaker, um, you're in for a treat tonight. Um, I wanted to, oh, first of all, oh, I need to, sorry, mention our sponsors tonight. Um, on this flyer, it was printed by Sprint Press. They also printed tonight's uh, event poster. And uh, this uh, was printed on white speckle tone. Um, and if you want to have questions about this paper, you can meet Brian French tonight, who graciously sponsored this event from French Paper. He's here tonight, down here. So uh, yeah, everybody thank him for that. And I also need to mention Design Council, who co-sponsors all our speaking events here at DAM for hosting us and allowing us to use this amazing venue year after year. Um, tonight, though, before um, Chuck speaks, um, I wanted to introduce um, Donna Kerwin. And she is, this is a long title, Donna, I'm sorry. But uh, she is the curatorial assistant for the architecture, design, and graphics here at DAM, and Shannon Espinoza who is the AIJ Collections Assistant. And as you, most of you probably know, the, A, the National Design Archives are housed here at DAM. And uh, they're going to explain a little bit about that process and what's happening with the um, collection. So without further ado, I'll have them come up. And Thanks, Charles. Well, Shannon and I are really excited to be here tonight to be able to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing um, in the archive. The Denver Art Museum acquired the AIGA archive in 2007, and it's a huge collection of graphic design objects. We have close to 11,000 in the collection, and they date back to about 1980. Since 2007, AIGA adds to the archive each year with a set of 200 to 300 objects uh, from its current yearly juried competitions. And these are titled 365, which refers to the best design in all media for the year, and 5050, which represents the 50 best books and 50 best book cover designs of the year. And I know that many of you are familiar with these year yearly competitions. The competitions have also been expanded in recent years to include designers from Europe, Asia, and Canada, as well as Central and South America. 
Over the years, the competitions have changed. And this is a partial list of the names of some of the competitions over the years. Their names suggest the types of work that's accepted by the judges. These competitions also continue to evolve in response to changing attitudes about design over the years and in response to a desire by AIGA to remain relevant to all designers. So here's a partial list of the design media, um, a list that's developed over the years. Some of these obviously represent tangible objects, such as books or product packaging. Others are intangible, such as um, a, a design for an environment or an experience. Um, that could be an exhibition of some sort or a website or film or TV titles. So as a quick overview of the archive, I want to show you some examples of what we have. And these are my attempt to show you a cross-section of these different media disciplines. Um, obviously, this is only the tiniest taste of what's there. So I thought that book and book cover design is a good place to start. This discipline spans some of the most commercial books that are for sale to some that are much less known. Stephen Colbert's book was a winner for book design in 2007's 50 Books, 50 Covers competition. And the people at Doyle Partners describe this assignment as a typographic brain transplant, saturated with self-aggrandizement and self-importance from the almost life-sized head on the cover to the pages that are stained Republican red. Another very different example is the one in the middle, um, the cover for The Way Through Doors, which illustrates a novel in which stories are nested within each other as a series of openings with one word um, of the title on each. We also have series of books, such as this Les Alousifs series, um, with a unified design for different books by different authors. In contrast, we also have many examples of McSweeney's quarterly journal. And McSweeney's designs are unified over time by each issue's complete originality. Another type of design discipline that's represented in the archive is brand and identity systems design. And this can be as simple as a company's logo, as you know, or it can be thought of as a broader concept, such as the identity that Pentagram created for the Museum of Arts and Design, also known as MAD. We have quite the collection of material from the MAD redesign. We have bags in various sizes, sets of blocks, toys, books, brochures, huge selection of things. Pentagram designed the MAD monogram, which um, is on the left, as an entire alphabet of numbers based on a basic combination of squares and circles called MAD face. These geometric letters reflect the circles and squares that are present in the MAD's new building and its location on Columbus Circle. Another example from our collection of imaginative and memorable branding uh, is this collection of pirate supply products. Office created essentials that every pirate needs, such as a beard extension kit, peg leg oil, giant squid repellent, and glass eye drops. And sales of these products, just in case you don't, some of you don't know, benefit 826 um, Valencia, 826 Valencia, a nonprofit tutoring center for youth that was founded by McSweeney's editor, Dave Eggers. In the area of illustration, posters are the most common form that we have in the collection. Um, here's an example of um, an entire series of posters that we have that are designed by the artist Luba Lukova whose artwork uses bold and deceptively simple graphics um, and often comments on social or political issues. And the collection also includes this poster series by Michael Schwab, where the image is reduced to a black outline with a single headline in bold lettering and framed and filled with pure flat color. And some of the archive's more eye-catching packaging examples include, for example, a set of uh, Kleenex boxes at the top from 2009 that combine a photorealistic illustration with a unique box shape. Or at the bottom um, is Kate Spade's packaging, where brightly colored lids and box bases are interchangeable and can create endless varieties of color combinations. Staying with packaging for just a minute longer, the collection is also particularly strong with music packaging. CDs, record albums, but also with associated print material with these things, such as books and posters. 
The collection also highlights some of the best examples of how editorial designers use typography and illustrations to set up a story or a magazine spread and to grab your attention at the same time. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with the opening sequence for Mad Men, shown at the top there, um, with the character free falling from the tall office building past all the different advertisements. And then it resolves into this closing image, which became the branding device for the show. And I just want to mention here, along with motion graphics, that in recent years, these competitions include increasing, increasing numbers and varieties of digital media. Um, and these often come to us here at the museum as a CD or a DVD or a flash drive. So we have all of that kind of thing, and we collect all of that here as well. So the collection is so comprehensive, it includes, it includes many other disciplines and categories that we don't have time to cover here, but I did select just a couple other examples. Um, a photo of temporary walls at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts during some construction at the top, and they took paintings in their collection and put them on this, in this, wall wet, in this hallway. Um, and put hard hats on the figures in the paintings, in case you can't see that, it was very ingenious. Um, and then in the middle is the Chipotle iPhone app. Um, the bottom image is a Stefan Sagmeister coin mural from Experimental Design 2008 in Amsterdam. So I've covered some of the content of this collection, but this was the reality for us back in 2007. This is how the archive came to us. It was 178 brown cardboard boxes, and each one had a surprise inside waiting for us. So I will turn it over to Shannon, and she's going to cover storage of the archive and cataloging that we've been doing. Thank you. So this is what we started with. 178 boxes full of every type of material you can think of. So we briefly started looking at kind of what we had and what we needed to accomplish in 2008. And this allowed us to apply for appropriate grants. And in 10, 000, 2010, we were awarded an NEA grant for the time span of two, th two years in which we were to complete the initial inventory, cataloging, condition assessment, and storage of this collection. The uniqueness of this collection required multiple departments, including registration, collections, conservation, curatorial, to come together within the museum with the main question of how do we give these artworks the attention they need in a traditional museum setting. So here's what this process looked like over the past two years. Each object was taken out of its original box. It's numbered, measured, conditioned. The condition is recorded in our database on a scale from one to four, one being needs immediate attention and four being in stable condition. Just like we would treat anything that comes through our doors, a Picasso, a Van Gogh, it's treated with the same um, amount of respect and attention. This information is gathered and is placed into our museum database, which you can see on the upper left-hand side. And we also tried to correlate with the AIJ archive website. Um, if you haven't been to this yet, I suggest everyone go. It's just AIJArchive.com. Um, this provided us with the official title of each object, the competition it came from, and who the design firm is. So we added all this into um, each record as well. Once data entry was complete, every object was photographed with its number and then later entered into its record in our database. Um, one of the largest goals of this project was to put these artworks into a safer environment in its museum speak for rehousing. And that just means that each item is encased in acid-free material placed into an acid-free box and it can stay there for years and years and years without being harmed. So this is a before and after of what that looked like. So this is kind of an example of what we saw when we opened these boxes and then um, what we tried to do for it after. And if you work in a museum, this is pretty exciting. This is awesome. This doesn't get better than that. Okay. 
As Donna has mentioned, we have all types of materials in the collection, some of which include food and liquid. So normally we don't want that in a museum storage. So we kind of had to come together and think about what we were going to do. And a lot of you might be thinking, well, why can't you just take the food and liquid out? But as you can see in these examples, the contents inform much of the exterior design. So the color of the honey mimics the label and the liquid of the bottle works with the typeface on the outside. Conservation and Curatorial have worked closely on this issue and our immediate resolution was to place these in double bags and airtight containers away from the collection just in case something leaked. And now everything that we have is stable and isolated from the archive. In the future, we are going to give this more of a permanent conservation, but obviously with close attention to the integrity of the design. Okay, so we did that 11,000 times, and now we have a collection that's searchable, it's documented, and it's all safe and stored and happy. But this was just only the beginning, so we've only completed initial processing. Our work is not done. We are still working on taking the collection into the next step, which includes conservation and more permanent rehousing. And we just wanted to reiterate, since we have become so intimate with the archive, we know how pretty amazing it is. And even though it's stored in Denver, it belongs to Bordabello. <laughs> Just sit there here. We wanted to remind everybody that it's everyone's collection. It's nationwide. It doesn't just belong to Denver. It belongs to all of you and the whole country. So we kind of see the potential right now as um, a great exhibition possibilities, program possibilities, and hopefully an amazing resource, resource for researchers and educators. Um, so if you have any questions for us, we can't really take any right now, you can go to the AD&G website, their email address right there. So thank you. So I want to thank Shannon that anytime something unexpected and amazing happens, now you can say Portobello. <laughs> Maybe it'll catch on. Um, one more thing I needed to thank um, for tonight was um, our members. And uh, so um, if anyone has any membership questions, you can go to AIJcolorado.org. We couldn't do this without you, so thank you so much for your membership. And also, if you have questions, you can uh, meet Julie, and she'll talk to you about that or just go online. Um, so welcome to the last lecture in our Pursuit of Happiness series which also happens to be the kickoff for our new lectures for the fall. Um, tonight, we have the pleasure of meeting a true design icon. Uh, Charles S. Anderson uh, started his work in 1989 as a formal studio. And uh, it, it says this on the website, but it really is true that uh, CSA is probably one of the most influential design firms. Um, his work has been featured in uh, the New York Museum of Modern Art, the Center Pompidou, the Smithsonian, the Cooper Hewitt, National Design Museum, and the Library of Congress. And also, as you just saw, um, he had a tour this afternoon of the design archives, and there's a lot of his work here in Denver as well. Um, but on a more um, kind of tangible level, if you've ever had a design project and you were inspired to print it on craft paper, you can thank Charles S. Anderson for coming up with that in the 80s. That was even before French paper made craft paper. So uh, he truly is someone who uh, you've seen his work, um, and now we get to all hear the story about it. So everyone, if you could please welcome Charles S. Anderson. Great introduction. Thanks for that. Uh, Got to get some water. Very dry here. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> yes, there we go. 
All right, I think I'm going to start out. Uh, everybody here okay? I'm going to play a short video. It's kind of an office tour because, uh, you know, a lot of words and flat pictures kind of never really show it, give you an essence of uh, what it's like uh, actually in the studio. So we did this uh, super short little two-minute video that I think I'm going to try to run. If we can uh, maybe bring the lights down a bit here, we'll see if we can uh, get this to go. Bear found newspapers, the fascinating use of color, blow molded Russian cat, weird 60s mermaid lady, 3D can of plastic junk. Inspiration comes from anywhere. Charles S. Anderson Design Company has been around for about 22 years, and the focus here has always been adding something positive uh, to the world, something memorable. Clients that the design firm has worked for include, uh, of course, French Paper, and then worked for Target and Turner Classic Movies, Paramount Pictures, the New York Times, Isuzu, Nike. Yeah, these little guys for Target Halloween campaign. We did the three-dimensional figures for these candy toppers. We also did the packaging label. We did the uh, in-store signs, did the packaging, product for sale, even down to designing the actual costumes. And that's the kind of partnerships we look for, where we can really utilize our, our skills. And CS Images is kind of the licensing piece. It's the home for the image collection. It really started back when Clyde Lewis left me his basically life's work that spanned his career from 1930 to 1970s. This stuff is all hand drawn, this stuff is all uh, handmade, this stuff is what I consider real art. And the archive has a massive amount of original content and original illustration, original photography. We have like 4,000 photographs now that form the Plastoc collection. Literally millions and millions of pieces of dusty printed materials, historic materials, entire libraries of bound periodicals from all over the world. And then we change and alter, make them more bold and graphic, change the context, uh, redraw, add color, combine with other things. It's this weird combination of historic base, of preservation, and also of invention and, and creation. At the level we got, the level and the quality of illustration, I think it's the largest collection in the world. It's certainly the most tightly curated. We used to uh, kind of build the archive as a museum of art for commerce. You know, unlike a museum you walk in and look at the pictures, we can't do anything. This is a museum you can kind of go in online and actually get the images and actually build something and do something. The goal wasn't uh, business people shaking hands and all this cliche stock stuff. One of the goals is what are, what are the other stock companies would, would never do? What would they never have? And that's what we try to come up with. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, any questions? <laughs> if it were only that easy. <laughs> I could have just sent the thing. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, let's see if I can see here. Um, yeah, this is a, a symbolic poster we did for AIGA Minnesota's design camp. And you know, Minnesota is kind of a, a weird place. It's uh, not only the land of 10,000 frozen lakes and endless winters, but also other strange dichotomies. It's the home of Paul Bunyan and pine trees, but also the Walker Art Center uh, and an AIJ chapter that's second only to New York in size. Uh, this collision of high design and low art with a dose of camp and kitsch has greatly influenced our design work over the years. We view design as a product rather than just a service to corporate clients. We don't diminish the impact of art and design. In fact, we think a better description of what we do is, is to create art for commerce. We kind of think that art is the human, uh, uh, the, the, the aesthetic human cultural aspect of design that makes something interesting and compelling. Uh, without art, graphic design loses its allure and is reduced to nothing more than blatant marketing trash or lifeless information design. Uh, which unfortunately describes much of the supposedly hardworking, strategic, corporate, boring design produced in the world. Uh, we also believe that design is about making something, something great that adds richness to people's lives, uh, something inspiring, memorable, funny, beautiful, ugly, elegant, abrasive, anything but uninteresting. Our approach to design is a continuous evolution reflecting the highs and lows of art and popular culture. And in terms of visual aesthetics, it seems that much of the modern design movement threw out to the past in favor of starting over with a blank white slate. In doing so, they failed to build on the shoulders of giants who had gone before them, and at the same time stripped away much of the humanity and culture built up by prior generations. We believe that engaging with the past provides perspective that can help more accurately envision the future. 
Or as Churchill once said, the further backward you can look, the further forward you're likely to see. We strive to create work that is both timely and timeless, inspired by the entire history of modern design. This is a kind of a diagram of the company, the structure. Uh, it, it's unlike most design firms, made of three parts. Uh, Charles S. Anderson Design Company, CSA Images, and Pop Inc. CSA Design specializes in identity and brand development, package design and product design, and we view all these as uh, related components of a unified whole. And we also believe that they're the most essential and most visible areas of design. They also happen to be the most fun and the most interesting. We don't design any reports or corporate brochures, and the majority of the print collateral we design is for our long-term client and friend of 25 years, uh, Jerry French of the French Paper Company. Uh, CSA Images in the middle is our stock image uh, subsidiary developed over the past several decades. And uh, CSA Images license visual content across a number of different media types. Pop Inc. is our own brand of products, an experimental idea lab. Uh, and Pop Inc. was produced in collaboration with French Paper and Laurie DiMartino Design. This is our uh, little historic office building downtown Minneapolis. Uh, it was built in 1854. It was the 27th building built in the city, and uh, it's about uh, a block from the Mississippi River. Uh, I really feel extremely fortunate to work with such an incredibly talented and dedicated group of people at, at the company. Uh, this is Karen. She's the uh, astonishingly capable organized office manager, bookkeeper, keyword specialist, and CS Images licensing director. We kind of call her the only normal person at the office. This is uh, Eric Johnson, my co-creative director, brilliant conceptual thinker who can also write, illustrate, and design a rare combination. Sheridan Green is our senior designer and resident foodie, uh, also an amazing designer that can uh, also illustrate and solve any problem, uh, either aesthetics or technology-based. Giovanni Hollingsworth, uh, our Photoshop Jedi master, incredible uh, designer and illustrator with great eye for color and detail. Peter Wortman, Awesome illustrator, super geek, web developer. And uh, Kayla Campbell, amazing illustration skill, color sense, and also sense of humor. Uh, we, d we view design as a product, not just a service to corporate clients and to us. Uh, design is a digital asset that can also be owned and licensed indefinitely. This next section is about logos we've done in the past. A quick overview. Uh, designed a lot of logos. One's for Pepsi, Paramount Pictures, French Paper, and even Betty Crocker on the right-hand side. It's for an article in Newsweek. She was 170 years old, and uh, we thought she needed an update, so we did the, uh, <laughs> the old spoon and fork. Also, we did a logo for Tiger Woods in the lower left, and uh, we designed over 20 different logos for Tiger Woods. Uh, but unfortunately, Tiger decided that he wanted to design the logo himself, which, of course, was really terrible. So. One afternoon, I decided to call Tiger Woods up and said to him, you know, Tiger, how about you stick to playing golf and we'll stick to designing your logo? Because that generic spinning gizmo you came up with is not very unique. And, you know, a pause on the phone and Tiger replied, you know, you're right. I'm a golf professional. You're a design professional. We'll go with your logo. He went on to say, uh, I'm also doubling your design fee and thanks for stopping me from making uh, yet another horrible mistake. And then I woke up from my dream. <laughs> Actually, they used, they used Tiger Woods' horrible generic logo for about the first uh, three or four years until the people inside at Nike could convince them how bad it was, and they changed it out. Not to one of ours, though, one that Nike in-house had done. So that's the end of that sad story. <laughs> this is a wider selection of logos we've designed over the past two decades. Uh, we believe that a logo by itself doesn't make a successful corporate identity. Uh, the company behind the logo has to have a solid reputation and produce goods, uh, good products or services. Uh, we, uh, we like to think that designing an identity for a bad company that makes bad products is a bit like trying to polish a turd. <laughs> you might succeed in making it shine, but it'll still smell. And for example, Paul Rand was the brilliant designer and thinker, but his logo for Enron did little to uh, affect the image of that company uh, or its demise. We look at logos as just a single piece of an identity or brand, along with the actual product and the packaging. Uh, years ago, when I was designing the uh, Denny for Turner Classic Movies, I remember Ted Turner complaining about how high our design fees were. Now, 20 years later of continuous use, the logo doesn't seem to be quite as expensive. At the time, when I thought about it, I figured that if Ted owned a ranch in Montana that was so big it could be seen from outer space, uh, he could probably afford the design fee. 
<laughs> Something I love to tell clients uh, when they complain about prices is quality is always remembered long after the price is forgotten. They hate hearing that. <laughs> they, they prefer like uh, the, the old adage of uh, no time to do it right, but always time to do it over. That's where clients like to go usually. But Halifax Health was, was an extensive corporate ID program we designed for a medical center in Florida. And uh, the identity strikes a balance between clean, modern, yet warm and human, sometimes opposing ideals. Double H letter form built around a medical cross, which takes the form of a butterfly to signify health and vitality. I have some really old notions about logos. Uh, most of these were drilled into my head by my MCAT instructor and first employee, Peter, first employer, Peter Seitz. Uh, Peter was kind of like the real deal. Uh, his design education began in the new Bauhaus in Ulm, Germany, under Max Bill, and then at Yale with Bradbury Thompson and Paul Rand. After working for famed architect I.M. Pei, he was recruited to Minneapolis for a position at the Walker Art Center as their first design curator. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, Peter uh, hired me. I'm not quite sure why, because he always thought my stuff was kind of lowbrow, and uh, he would say to me, uh, these funny little drawings, that is not design in his best German accent. <laughs> but uh, I, I worked with him for two years and really kind of like learned a lot about how to uh, fuse my love for lowbrow pop culture that I uh, kind of gained by love of comic books and growing up in Iowa and his whole uh, extremist Helvetica German uh, modernist trait. Uh, but Peter believed that a logo should be uh, simple, distinct, memorable, reducible, reproducible, and timeless. And it also must work in black and white which is, uh, I guess, what's not really happening nowadays, all the three-dimensional, shiny, spinning gizmos that are going on out there. But uh, speaking of black and white, kind of like this uh, Inky the Octopus logo that we designed for Custom Inc. Custom Inc. is a new client, licensed and partner of ours. Uh, they're the nation's leading online custom print-on-demand t-shirt manufacturer. Here's some additional applications. Uh, this is the logo applied to a shipping box and this is a great project because what makes it even more uh, impactful is, are the tens of thousands of CSA images that we license to Custom Inc. So now the customers can use them to design their own silkscreen t-shirts online. And uh, the inside carton features some of the images. The archive was really created for this application. Uh, we just had to wait for a few decades for it to be invented so it could be fully utilized. Uh, and uh, online print on demand is uh, really what, what, what this thing was made for. This is the customing site kind of showcasing some of the t-shirts using our images. And these guys really invented the, uh, the, this whole technology. Uh, Mark Katz, the CEO, a uh, great guy, went to Harvard for physics, uh, was recruited by Wall Street uh, to be an analytics guy because he's a big numbers guy and uh, hated Wall Street and all the people attached to it and uh, split off after being there for a year and started this company with his Harvard computer engineering buddy and uh, pretty much designed the uh, the technology pre-cloud about uh, designing shirts in real time online. This is the Target Halloween brand identity you saw a little bit in the video. It's probably the most fun, one of the most extensive programs we've ever uh, undertake. Uh, we worked on it for like two years and uh, we designed the signage along with packaging products across all categories including some of the costumes themselves like the little squirt costume which was the number one selling costume in Target that year. And our uh, designs were applied to thousands of different products in the store. The whole campaign was inspired by the campy aesthetic of vacuum plastic Halloween masks uh, designed with a contemporary pop art twist. Uh, yeah, this is a great project for our design firm. Branded any packaging, product design, all together, kind of a, a rare project. We also designed about 50 different uh, Halloween patterns, kind of like haunted house wallpaper. And uh, this is some other packaging and, and, and things that we kind of specialized in for clients like Best Buy, Blue Q, French paper in El Paso, Chile. This is something we kind of uh, kind of made up ourselves, uh, Brand X liquor packaging, one of our own concepts. Kind of looked at the vodka category in liquor stores and decided that uh, everything's been done, but really hard to break that category open. Unless you walked in the store and every bottle was different and there was a whole block and no matter which one you grabbed, there were at least hundreds of different designs. So we started with this flat decanter that looked like a, uh, look, looked like a bottle and then we use that as a blank slate to put silhouettes of, of bottles on the bottle with bottle-related ideas. Some of my favorite, like Laura Less, Mazel Tov cocktail with Chutzpa, oi. <laughs> or the uh, obsolete vodka with a brick phone. 
It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you remember of Wacky Packs when you were a kid, those little stickers from Tops. They're kind of like Wacky Packs, but with booze instead of gum, which we thought, <laughs> we thought that might be a good way to go. Uh, and I think this pop art approach to packaging is unique to us. We take a broader overview of the category and approach it in a new way, viewing the package as a surface to showcase an unlimited series of artwork, uh, which gives it a continually new face. This is another brand called Artist Proof that, we were, that we're working on. Uh, yeah, it emerges liquor with home decor and gifts, which I thought was a good combination. Uh, the bottle's reusable with a wide mouth that allows it to double as a sustainable vase or decanter. And uh, the concept revolves around the name with a glass bottle with uh, custom molded into the shape of a frame, complete with wood grain embossed on the sides. And then uh, permanent fired on artwork from CS Images and uh, variations uh, from abstract to thematic. This is a, a project from Olili, uh, a fashion company. Uh, we found that there's been a lot of uh, growing interest in, in CS images for uh, apparel companies, and uh, the progressive Dutch fashion company Olili used this for their whole fall campaign. This is uh, for Lucky Brand. Uh, these are images for Euro U.S. and European billboard and poster campaign. This was the magic show in Vegas. Even Juicy Couture licensed their images uh, in the logo from us. And uh, we've been dabbling with products for a long time and thinking that, you know, design shouldn't just be about making something for corporations, but uh, designing something that uh, people believe in or something that, you know, people think that they could, should make or the world would want or need. And uh, so we're kind of the, the, uh, the, the front end of that in, in some ways. Uh, these are prototype products we did uh, long ago, like Slacks Cologne on our own watches, along with uh, Fossil and Timex back in the day. And then these are some uh, other prototypes that we've been messing around with, uh, uh, like maybe licensing with M & Co and, uh, you know, lamps with uh, Chinese lanterns hanging on them. And I love the uh, padded chair with the wood grain. So you get the wood grain look, but then you get the cushion as well. Or the chair with the chair on it. We tend to like really stupid things like that. <laughs> or the handbag with the uh, Japanese maps. So if you're lost, you can just look at the bag and try to figure that out. <laughs> this is the uh, logo for Pop Inc. Pop Inc's our own brand that merges uh, low art and high design into an infinite visual universe. And these are some Pop Inc product samples guarded by our studio mascot, uh, Mr. French, AKA Oliver Johnson one of our two twin Boston Terriers that come around the office every day. And our goal with Pop Inc. was to create uh, kind of saccharine, sweet, slightly disturbing, yet strangely compelling art and artifacts for the postmodern world. These are the Pop Inc. buttons. And uh, this is kind of how we launched it, a uh, Happy Kitty Bunny Pony book. So yeah, Pop Inc. products were launched uh, with a series of books published by Abrams and distributed worldwide by Time Warner Books. And you kind of have to have media to build a brand. It's helpful to have a movie, TV show, or a book. And of course, movies and TV shows are kind of hard to pull off. So this was the book we did. And uh, it was an instant hit. reached number two on Amazon in the humor category, right uh, behind John Stewart's America. And uh, each book in the series contained hundreds of images with text by Mike Nelson, the guy who does the Mystery Science Theater 3000. Pretty funny guy. And the books provide a glimpse of the strange and varied imagery along with the odd humor that defines Pop Inc. brand. Like the, uh, the chainsaw bunny. And uh, Daily Candy did a review of the book and they said, uh, the line between cute and creepy is a fine one. No one gets this pop culture phenomenon like the folks at CSA Design. Probably the highest compliment ever paid to our design firm. But, uh, the second book was called Gothicy. That's the book, No Card and Journal. And it's got uh, pages like this about a school janitor. You must learn to tell the difference between a ghoul and a school janitor, or it could cost you your life. <laughs> Ghouls are leering, creepy thugs prowling the dark places. School janitors are pretty much the same, except they're usually wearing a name tag and carry around that sawdust stuff you throw and vomit. <laughs> Next book was called Lovesick. Our title was Love Sick and Twisted, but it got edited. Uh, and then features things like the <laughs> his, his and her toilet. And then, of course, 
we had to have a follow-up to Happy Kitty Bunny Pony, so a dog-eared sequel. And uh, didn't quite make it to the door. Doggy burrito snacks, kind of a bad product idea. We shouldn't pursue that one. Then we moved on to dinnerware, and these are popping dinnerware packages called culinary art. They're melamine plates, and uh, popping proves that you can have your art and eat off it too. And uh, this is called Cannibal Kingdom. It's featuring cute critters with sharp objects and raw hunks of meat. <laughs> this was Tokyo to go. <laughs> Junk food geishas, pizza hot dogs, and the KFC bucket. The chopsticks, that's my favorite. So the, the big idea here, again, deep thinking, the big idea was uh, you know, food-related themes on plates that are made to hold food. We kind of thought that was breakthrough, but you know. <laughs> again, we like things that are so dumb they're kind of puzzling. But this is another one of the best sellers uh, called Food for Thought, Cow, Pig, Lamb, and Dog. <laughs> and the butcher meat charts, then the, the dog is the best seller. We like to say these plates are equally offensive to vegans and meat eaters alike, also popular in North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's really bad. These were called uh, dirty dishes or naked lunch. <laughs> my wife, Lori Martino designed these. And uh, my 10-year-old daughter, Grace, likes to sit and pose in those positions because we have the plates on the wall. And we're like, <laughs> probably not cool. <laughs> Then we, then we moved into uh, uh, popping soaps, and uh, again with some strange names like soap opera and wash sabi. That's the one. Other names like bird bath, clean and slobber with the dogs on it. Proving that the only good pun is a bad pun. It's kind of how we go here. And uh, this is called uh, Clean Lines. This was designed by again, my wife, again, Laura DiMartino, and uh, uh, printed on French paper. The pop tone line we designed for French and printed in just two colors, uh, silver and brown, which is really kind of like that approach. These are uh, decor boards we did. These are great. All this stuff, the, the melamine and a lot of this stuff is printed digitally, which I love because uh, we can start competing with China again because now we can do things like this. Just one or just two. And uh, it's pretty amazing. The color here is the most amazing I've ever seen printed on birch, and the melamine stuff, they printed on digitally on melamine sheets, then smashed it on the melamine plates with the old press that was originally done in the 50s for melamine. And it's incredible that uh, now we can make products and not have to have focus groups, not have to have tests, not have to have warehouses of stuff that didn't work and throw away or try to find a place to sell it. Now you can try things and see if they work, and if they do, make more, and if they don't, don't. It's really a pretty amazing time right now. And of course, for us, the entire digital archive that I spent my entire life building uh, the digital is now going back to the atoms and becoming real products again. And it's really uh, really kind of amazing what's going on, I think. This is some uh, gift wrap that we did. Uh, you know, more, more really bad names. Like, I think the one with the rings is called Repeat Engagement. And uh, the wood grain one is Distinguished Panel. And the, the pink flocked one to the far right is from a series with names like Flocked Up and Totally Flocked. <laughs> And of course, this gift wrap is called Well Conceived. <laughs> we, we did a lot of research, and we thought that the only thing the gift world was missing was a scientific depiction of where babies come from. <laughs> kind of thought it'd be good for baby showers and birthdays alike. <laughs> and these are our pop ink memo books, printed on a variety of French papers. Uh, and of course, the inspiration from this, thanks to our former design intern, uh, Aaron Draplin, who started with us right off of MCAD, and uh, amazing guy and incredibly talented designer. And we've had, I think, over like 50 interns since 1989 when I started the design firm. And some interns just sit there and do grunt work and scan and be like a drone and pick up some stuff, but maybe not much, and then leave. He's the only person that really has just grasped the whole thing. And grabbed the entire history of design, understood the part about building on the shoulders of giants, and uh, has done just incredibly well and 
has produced some amazing work. And uh, God, what a talented speaker, too. He's a pretty, pretty funny guy, great storyteller. So another, uh, then we got into cards from that. Did the gift wraps, we had to do the, uh, the cards. Uh, this is uh, called Santa's Package. <laughs> we like to say it gives new meaning to the word stocking stuffer. <laughs> and of course the word disturbing doesn't quite do it justice. <laughs> then we decided to do greeting stamps because we could take a blank note card and turn it into a greeting card because it's always like the right picture of the wrong words or the wrong words the right picture. So we came up with these stamps and uh, Mike Nelson wrote them. Things like, happy birthday, you're aging like fine cheese. Get well soon, you're really starting to depress me. <laughs> happy anniversary, see, sometimes settling can work. <laughs> They're pretty grim. Those are some of the other note cards we've done in the series. And uh, these are the popping note cards with color-coordinated French pop-tone envelopes, which was... Uh, Kind of a, a good mix. And uh, my views on design being a product rather than just a service are finally becoming legitimized after you know decades. Uh, in, in one way, it's by the new uh, design exhibit that will be traveling to museums across the country. I think it opens up in LA this month, and it's called Graphic Design Now in Production, and uh, co-curated by the Walker Art Center uh, in Minneapolis, which was where it opened last fall, and the Smithsonian Institution's Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. And this is the, uh, this is the uh, exhibit at the Walker, which was kind of cool, because they had all the popping products in a cube, and they had them all on a, on, a, in a, on a table with multiples. And then right behind it, just out of the picture, they had a table where you could actually buy it in the museum. So it was about uh, designers basically making stuff, uh, making products, and being their own author and doing things. It was, it was very, very kind of surreal. But uh, this is the uh, catalog cover. And uh, the Walker's largest museum exhibit on design in 22 years. Uh, catalog spread featuring pop ink products. Uh, once considered a service industry, a good portion of today's graphic design is self-initiated or entrepreneurial work. Designers are no longer just the intermediary, intermediary between the corporation and the intended audience. Designers have gone beyond formatting the messages of others and are now creating their own content and stories and conveying their own ideas. So this exhibit, exhibition portrays graphic design as a viable art form beyond its origins in marketing and communications. Another catalog spread. Uh, French paper is represented in the show, not only in the pop ink line of products, but also in the catalog itself is printed on French dirt on newsprint, which was pretty great. Uh, people from the Walker Art Center came up to Niles, Michigan, and uh, actually watched the paper be made, which was really cool, and took a, took a video so they documented the process. And, you know, we're kind of thrilled to be included in the exhibit and also really humbled by how many other designers in the exhibit chose to print their work on French paper, like some of the people shown here. And speaking of French, uh, this is the French paper man. This is French paper's identity before I started working with them. The sign was my very first impression of the French paper uh, company in Niles, Michigan on my initial visit to the mill in the 1980s. When I first drove and I saw this little paper guy smiling. His neon mouse smiles or frowns depending on the safety record in the plant. <laughs> so actually when we got there, uh, the first time I saw it he was actually uh, uh, frowning because somebody just got their arm torn off the paper machine and he wasn't very happy about that, so no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> somebody hurt their foot or something, no big deal, but anyway, so <laughs> yeah, he smiles now. But yeah, that was kind of, uh, that left a big impression on me, this, uh, and uh, it had, had a lot to do with uh, kind of where the brand went and how it's evolved over the years. Uh, this is what the French paper company looked like in the 50s and 60s. And uh, this is uh, French paper's hydro generators, which creates energy from the St. Joe River. Unlike paper mills who say they make their paper out of wind power, but you're just buying it from the same power company who bought it before and paying more to develop wind credits or something. These guys actually have the dam, they actually have the generators, they actually have, uh, have the whole thing, and they've had it for uh, 80 years. Uh, not because they're green, but because they were smart and cheap. That's what conservation used to mean. And uh, that's how French made it through that last economic downturn called the Great Depression. This is a, a letterpress piece we did for the uh, hydro mailer to talk about the 
French making electricity, which they actually make more than milk and use and sell it back to the, uh, the town of Niles, Michigan, which is really cool too. So they use this power to make all their paper. They use no petroleum, which has saved just massive amounts of barrels of oil uh, since the beginning. These are the logos we've designed for French over the years. They were a pioneer of recycled paper in the 50s and almost single-handedly popularized the use of recycled paper in the 80s through today. French has been around since 1871 and is the last, one of the last small family-owned independent mills left in America. Last year, French paper celebrated its 140th anniversary. Three generations of the French family still work at the mill, which I'm just amazed by. Uh, generation four, Big Ed French. Uh, he's 88, Brian just told me, and uh, still gets at the mill at 4.30 every morning and uh, yells at Jerry French, who gets there at 5, for being late. <laughs> Brian comes in at 6, and they say, good afternoon, when he shows up. <laughs> so he's holding a brown wrap because it's on packing brown wrap paper. Generation 5 is Jerry French, and of course, he always gets beat on the most, so he's the butcher with the wrap. It's on butcher paper with a dead fish. And then, of course, the youngster, Brian French, who's right here in the front row, reading the newspaper his, his, uh, on, on French newsprint. And uh, this is the former French paper president, the only non-French uh, family member that was ever president of French paper. His name is Bruce Bigford, and uh, me standing in front of the paper machine. I started designing for French in 1986 when I was 27 years old at the then newly formed Duffy Design Group. And at that time, I thought I'd have a lot of clients like French in my career. Uh, 25 years later, I realized that there will never be another client like French, a client with as much faith in the power of design. These are the uh, French paper swatch books. They've got about 10 different paper lines. And we just finished uh, French's new business cards and kind of changed up their identity uh, to coincide with the 140th anniversary. Those are the card backs that utilize many of the icons we designed for French over the past 25 years. And we just redid the giant shipping carton that holds the 26 by 40 sheets. And uh, it's really cool to go in the warehouse and see like thousands of these stacked up with forklifts and things. Uh, it's kind of a visual kaleidoscope of all the logos and icons that have made French paper one of the top brands to designers over the years. There's a close up of the carton. This is a uh, pop tone color papers. So French pretty much produced an entire line of papers designed to complement the uh, popping gift cards and wrap. This is the Poptone Fandic. We like to say it's uh, 24 sweet colors that run. That turned design into eye candy, including snow cone, red hot, raspberry. These are the Fandic pages. Uh, in, again, it's uh, inside really super cheap two color offset printing, silver and brown, which allows the paper rather than the ink to become the dominant color and stand out. Had a lot of fun coming up with the names too, like jelly bean green and hot fudge. And uh, these are the French Think on Paper ads. And for us, this campaign was a return to the joy of pure color paper and also the simpler design approach from our earlier French promotions. This is for Lemon Drop. The entire campaign was printed uh, on two colors and includes a grid of paper color chips on the back to convey the idea that paper can provide the color instead of the ink. So it's pretty much a manifesto for simple economical use of color paper. Stand out in an RGB CMYK design industry where generic white paper is the default. Kind of talks about thinking about the paper instead of just the uh, blank white screen. That's the entire campaign. 24 different ads, uh, all with artwork based on the name of the sheet and all printed in the same two colors. So it kind of shows you what, uh, what the paper can do. We also made some posters from this campaign. Uh, each one of them kind of symbolized the name of the paper. It's purple light on the left and factory green. Blue raspberry and shocking pink. Just spent a year uh, redoing the French paper site. Uh, French was the first American mill to sell paper online. Maybe the first mill in the world to sell paper online. Uh, and it would, have happened, it would have happened even sooner if it hadn't taken me two years to talk Jerry French into it. I assume we're in the discussion now. Buy paper through a computer? That's crazy. Science fiction. You flaky designers, what will you come up with next? <laughs> That's pretty much what the discussions go on anything we're trying to do, but anyway. So yeah, for, this is the new uh, buy paper page, 106 colors, all online, plus matching envelopes. New extended view. Uh, coming soon is a link showing actual print samples of specific paper you've selected. 
So we'll show that paper and print samples because we're going to hook it up with the French sample room, which is the, the blog. And also there'll be a high-res digital swatch of each paper you can download. And uh, we not only design French's identity promotions and websites, but also work with uh, French to develop the actual papers themselves, uh, of course, using input from designers like you, discussions we've had over the years. This is the uh, CSA Images Free on French design resource. Uh, usually CSA Images are only available for purchase, but since French Papers support helped build the archive over the years, it seems only right to give back to their customers uh, by giving them access to the most uh, amazing collection of black and white images on Earth for free. It's about 25,000 images and uh, elements and uh, dingbats on the site that are free, basically free to use when you print them on French paper. Those are just the galleries. Each one of those is uh, massively deep. So yeah, by making uh, t uh, tens of thousands of these images available, uh, French becomes the first mill to kind of like go into the digital realm, kind of beyond paper. This is the French sample room blog I mentioned before. Uh, goal is to show actual printed samples of every color of French paper, categories like poster, brochure, stationery. Some of the work of the best designers, uh, Silkscreen and Letterpress Printers America, are on this site. These are some examples. Even uh, Shepard Ferry's uh, iconic Obama poster was printed on speckletone cream paper. Followed by our slightly less popular Jerry French for President poster. <laughs> Didn't quite get the same amount of traction. Not quite sure why. Uh, if you've seen any of the French promotions, you'll know that we make a lot of fun, uh, qu quite a bit of fun of Jerry French in the promotions. And he especially hates it when we use his likeness, which of course we do all the time, <laughs> like this next series. This was a happy, good luck, inflatable Jerry French, offered as an online incentive. And I still remember when the first prototype came back. And he had to get these made in China, which he hates, of course, because these guys are like uh, everything made in the USA. But we couldn't find there wasn't a manufacturer left in America that makes these things. So had to break down and go to China. And when the first prototype came back in, I still remember Jerry in the office tearing off the, uh, the wrapper and pulling it out of its plastic bag. And then he looks at the uh, kind of the flash, the, 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 the flat monkey Jerry French face, and like, what the hell? <laughs> and then, then he starts blowing it up. And he doesn't realize until he gets it like almost completely blown up that the nozzle's in the crotch. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, this, I got this image stuck in my mind of Jerry French blowing up little Jerry. <laughs> And then, of course, then of course he said, "You flaky bastards," which is what he's fond of calling us. <laughs> and uh, so we we called China and told them they couldn't do that; they have to change it. And and then and then when the first shipment of twenty thousand came in, uh, they had changed it all right, and they they put it on the ass instead. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's uh. And of course, we did a header card that uh, Williamson Printing printed for us. And uh, we had such intentionally bad printing and bad registration built in the design that their, their color people fixed it all. And then we said, <laughs> no, it's supposed to look like it's really bad, like it was printed in the 80s in Hong Kong or something, you know? So they went back and did it. And then, of course, Jesse Williamson liked it, so we did an inflatable Jesse Williamson, too. And then all of a sudden, this place in China started getting all these orders from uh, corporations wanting the CEO done in an inflatable <laughs> version, which is really crazy. And then, of course, we had uh, Dusty the Dolphin and uh, Wallace the Magic Unicorn, but of course those were discontinued, so those ideas didn't work out as well. Then we did the uh, key figure. The Raymond Chow invented the, uh, the key figure from China, came and uh, wanted us to uh, design some, so we, we did the barcode bear first, and then we did the, uh, the key version of Jerry with the French embossed in the back of his head. And uh, Yeah, of course, the, the plastic toy Big Eye Jerry, or the, and then the uh, uh, Duran Duran, yeah, <laughs> Bad Nagel Jerry. It just seemed to make sense, though, since French is the company name, and since it's a family company, and there actually is a Jerry French, uh, you know, versus Mr. Mohawk and Mr. Nina, who don't exist, we thought using him as a trademark character for the company would be good. And... Uh, Jerry's the only client I've ever had uh, in my entire career that when we present a new design concept for promotion, we'll say, it's ugly, I don't like it, I don't think it's funny, but go ahead and do it. Because <laughs> I'm not the audience, as he said. 
you flaky people are. <laughs> so anyway, I also like it when I ask Jerry French how many people work at French Paper Company, and he says about half of them. <laughs> this is the, uh, the, the French urinal cake story. This one I've had, I've had for a while. It's hard to get rid of just because it's a good story, I think, but anyway. This was uh, after the opening presentation of the How Design Conference in Minneapolis. Jerry French went to the restroom and found himself 10th in line to use one of the 30 urinals that ran across the entire uh, giant restroom. When it was Jerry's turn, he stepped up and began to relieve himself. Looking down, he noticed something printed on the urinal deodorizer cake. It was his logo. <laughs> As he turned down and looked down the row of urinals, he discovered 29 other people also peeing on his logo. The yellow stained copy around the logo read, you're in business with French paper. <laughs> So Jerry said, what the hell, finished up. He stormed out of the restroom and hunted me down. He said, Anderson, this time you've gone too far. I guess we should have told him first. I said, sorry, Jerry, we didn't mean to piss you off. <laughs> so I felt lucky we didn't do our number two idea. It was even, it was much, much worse. This is another promotion that we finished up for French. Uh, it's called the French Aircraft Promotion, and uh, printed and die cut by Studio on Fire in Minneapolis. Ready for a dog fight with Mr. French at the, uh, at the stick. And then, of course, Mr. French Frisbee Promotion. <laughs> so hard to get him to balance that monocle. We had to shoot that thing about a thousand times. <laughs> and yes, it's supposed to be a French Bulldog, but we all know it's a Boston Terrier, which are superior. Boston Terrier is the only true American breed of dog ever bred in America, so we think that kind of fits better, but, you know, the French name, we have to kind of tie it in. And there's a lot of French bulldogs, you can't tell the difference, so close enough, we figured. And, of course, this is the uh, French Paper Stash promotion based on uh, French Paper's founder, J.W. French's amazing, gigantic mustache. And uh, these mustaches were designed, you know, uh, uh, on French paper, and they, they're pretty resilient, actually. You shove them up your nose, and they, they're, pretty, they're pretty snot resistant, actually. You can use them three or four times before they get too soggy, you gotta kind of throw them in the garbage can. <laughs> but, uh, this is a piece called Dispelling the Rumor, Mirror, Rumor Mill, and we designed this to clear up any misconceptions there are with French paper, like French is not a paper company from France, which people still think. French is her family name, oldest family uh, business in the state of Michigan, in fact. And uh, also people think that French can't make custom colors. They make thousands of different colors each year. Like these guys, I like lavender. They cannot make lavender, you numbskull. And of course, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be right if I didn't rip on the kid a little bit here. Brian French, who just got out of college and joined French paper, what, yesterday? No, four years ago, he said, which is, I'm sure it's been a long four years. <laughs> But anyway, to introduce him, we found this uh, Facebook shot from college <laughs> where he's got the, uh, the, the shades on. And of course, uh, we use the party pick shades and all, mostly to rip on, but also to introduce Brian, the sixth generation of the French paper family. So these are the uh, French paper shades promotion. Invites designers to join the party. And of course, Mr. French trying them out. A newer promotion we just finished is this Peacock Envelope promotion featuring all seven uh, sizes of, uh, of envelopes for French. And uh, French makes envelopes in every color of paper. And this shows a close-up of the die-cut holes that show the envelopes showing through. And uh, each envelope in the folder holds a popping pattern card, too. Kind of shows the color coordination on that. These are so new they're not even printed yet. They're uh, uh, posters we did... Uh, for Speckletone, we call it the paper that puts the gritty back in integrity. And uh, it's a modern and traditional representation. That reminder that French is the family name. French paper is made in the USA, not imported from France, and also uh, timely for the elections. I think uh, the one on the right is uh, Mitt Romney, and the one on the left is the uh, slightly hipper Obama. You make your own calls on that, I guess. but. So this is a little overview of CSA Images. Uh, many years ago, we established CSA Images as a separate company. 
to concentrate on licensing stock image collections created by our design firm. This is the new CS Images homepage, which allows you to browse by style. That's what I hate about the internet. You can keyboard search, but I don't think designers search like that. They don't want to type in a word. They want the picture to tell them the word. They want to browse visually, and it's really hard to do that online. So we came up with a couple hundred of these little categories and hand edited and pulled images that all worked or looked alike. Very hard to do, hundreds of hours. And uh, this is kind of how the scroll works. About 50,000 images online now. And uh, CSA uh, Images is dedicated to the creation and preservation of print and pop culture. Uh, the images are timeless, iconic, and modern, yet inspired by history and commerce. Over the years, CSA has created countless original photographs, illustrations, and design elements, along with seeking out and acquiring entire collections of original art from copyright owners. I like some of these names. Cheesy Sleazy is a popular category. Let's see if you can find Kooky Spooky. Pretty Kitty, Kitschy Critters in there someplace, the uh, Muscle Guy, Abnoxious, <laughs> and then finishing up with Spiromaniac. And of course, these are just galleries that give you just a, you know, there's probably, you know, four or 5,000 of these galleries, but uh, it's just a fraction of, of what's in the collection. Uh, we also have elements including icons and uh, dingbats and uh, pattern papers. Also, word images. I'm really, I'm really kind of into these. We've got about 10,000 of these, and we've got about 50,000 we're working on finalizing. Never been a big fan of typefaces. I always liked words that were hand-lettered or that were unique. Uh, so all these are words that you don't, won't find any typeface, and they're keyword searchable by word, and not just the word, related words, too, that might bring up that topic. And uh, we get about 100,000 of these done when I'm maybe 90 years old. It'll be an amazing thing where you can kind of search this section by word and get a illustrated word in like five or six different styles of whatever you're trying to say. 500,000 words in English language, 30,000 commonly used, 10,000, you got a ways to go here. But uh, that's everything we take on. Everything we take on is like a, a million hour project uh, decades ahead of us. But uh, I think there's really something to this. Uh, they don't sell at all. I don't think we've ever sold one of these, which is like, <laughs> But of course, that's, that's never the reason we do something in the first place. People seem to love them, though, and uh, you know, we have thousands of free downloads uh, every, every uh, month on Free on French, and uh, Free on French people use these like crazy, these in design elements. So I think there's a use. Also on Custom Ink, they're part of the t-shirt design things. You can grab them and design a t-shirt. So if you want to say something, use just like plain type and then one of these weird words for the middle word, and you've got a t-shirt that says something, but it actually looks like something, too. So I still think there's applications, we think. This is the CSA archive line art. This is where kind of the, the, the collection started. And uh, I think we've got like 25,000 hand-drawn, human imperfect, timeless classic illustrations. Each one kind of a mini masterpiece in this collection now. This is called Mex Inc. Black and White Illustration Collection inspired by Mexican comic book art. This is called Engrave Inc. Uh, hundreds of uh, really ridiculously detailed engraved illustrations. This is a intern, speaking of Draplin, in the 1980s passed out working on the first CS Images collection and book. The first book had 7,777 line art images, all done by hand with black ink and white ink pre-computer. Remember when we used to uh, send off faxes of images and we used to send them out FedEx one at a time. We used to have a stat camera and uh, it's amazing how far this has gone. We were doing this before Getty, before Corbis, before anybody uh, in the stock industry was doing illustration. Uh, a little bit of CSA Images history. Back in 1974, when I was still in high school, I met a retired commercial artist. He moved to this small town in Iowa where I was growing up. His name was Clyde Lewis. It's a big thing in the local paper. He did a, uh, a comic strip for the Sacramento newspaper. He did match book art. He did clip art. He did line art. He did commercial art. He could draw anything out of his head, any make of car or model in any perspective with no reference. He could hand letter. He'd use a Winsor Newton Series 7 red foxtail brush, and he would dip it in India ink and turn it. And he could do hairline rules with a ruler propped up on its side by hand with a brush. And to this day, I've still never seen anything like it. So I used to go hang out at his place after school, and he'd show me all this stuff and all these techniques. And uh, 
just an amazingly talented guy. And uh, uh, about two years after I met him and after he moved to Iowa to retire, he uh, actually died of lung cancer. And uh, he left me his entire life's work, which spanned like the 1930s to 1970s, which was his entire career. And that was the beginning of the CSA archive. And uh, uh, just kind of been been working on it ever since, but uh, definitely uh, owe the base of the whole thing to, to Clyde Lewis. Um, yeah, anyway, these are uh, just some more uh, images. Uh, but this is what the archive kind of represents now. It's uh, decades of work by Clyde and over 100 other designers and illustrators, artists and photographers have worked on the archive over the, over the years. Another collection called Mysterio, we call it Bad Taste, Beautifully Rendered. Uh, it's an illustration collection inspired by Mexican pulp cover paintings. It's Mysterio soap opera. This is the uh, Plastoc book. It's the first stock book with, uh, with uh, uh, text. There's a great future in plastics, our first step in the stock photography. This is the first rights managed digital stock photography collection ever, ever produced. And it's kind of based on my collection of 100,000 pieces of worthless plastic junk <laughs> that I've kind of scraped up from around the world. And it's cracked, chipped, dusty, broken. We hand painted 1,000 of these tiny objects with three hair brushes. Had interns working for about a decade on that. And uh, then we photographed them. And uh, massive amounts of Photoshop on the back end. Photographed a lot of them on generic gray backgrounds so we could color cast in the way we wanted to go. And uh, that's kind of a, a before and after. Uh, that's kind of an overview. And I remember uh, uh, years ago when Chip Kidd came to the office and we went down the basement and showed him the Sterilites, not nearly as nice or neat as the archive here, just junk thrown in Sterilites and Ziploc bags basically. And uh, showed him the 100,000 pieces of plastic stuff and he was like, you know, you should make, turn this into a museum. You should uh, put in glass shelves and cabinets. And, and I told him that I don't, I don't consider the, uh, the plastic junk to be the art. I consider what we do with it to be the art, kind of the same way with the entire archive, uh, the the, fi the final thing. So, I said that would uh, that would uh, see what did he call it? Uh, a combination of uh, hoarders, C C carny hoarders. That's what he called it. <laughs> the intersection of uh, yeah. Anyway, a little bit of that. So yeah, uh, back to Plastock here. Uh, this is the. Uh, Yes, decades of shooting, massive Photoshop work. And, and with Plastoc, we figured that if Andy Warhol could take low campy crap and elevate it to the, uh, the level of fine art, we could take this cheesy stuff and elevate it to the much la less ambitious level of stock art. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorites, uh, Vampire Santa and his little pal Winky the Elf, <laughs> sucking the true meaning on a Christmas, Christmas Halloween combo. Uh, yeah, we like to think of this as CSA images as pretty much the polar opposite of Bill Gates. Bill Gates, who owns Corbus, buys museums of art, like Leonardo da Vinci's original drawings, and the, uh, he's got the rights to the art in the Louvre. He buys entire museums of art, while we concentrate on the garage sale cultural underbelly, uh, which ironically does sometimes wind up in museums, like these. Uh, this is the Snapstock book of modernist illustrations. It took five years to design, illustrate, and color. It contains 5,000 images and weighs five pounds. I like to say there's lots of high fives when it was finally done. This is a Snapstock spread. Thousands of snappy uh, illustrations uh, influenced by art mov movements from abstract expressionism to cubism. We like to say it blurs the line between line art and fine art. This kind of shows a little bit of process. Uh, there's the original sketch and there's the final. We've become really adept at uh, adding paper tone, French paper tone digitally to stuff, so it looks like it's actually printed on paper, which is what I still love. Kind of like not a really big fan of all the uh, cyber slick stuff online that's uh, vectors with gradations in every quadrant just because you can do it. Maybe it doesn't mean you should. Uh, like the human kind of element, you know. This is a before and after on the uh, Beauty Queen, the original piece of scrap and what we made it. And this is the original sketch of the squirrel in the final. And of course, uh, finding these dingbats and then making that uh, in the snowflake tree. This is uh, Paul Rand, 
might, you guys might, might know this guy. Uh, this is a short story about the worst endorsement we've ever received for our CS Images collection. And from the design master himself, Paul Rand. I first met Paul in Tokyo at the 1989 Pan Pacific Design Conference. I was very, very young, and I'm sure he saw that I was a rookie. I had an opening for my design posters at the Ginza Gallery in Tokyo and was invited uh, to give a presentation at the conference. And much to my horror, I found out I had to follow Paul Rand, which was uh, kind of a uh, nerve-wracking experience. And after my presentation, he came up and told me that he didn't like the vernacular line art illustrations that I used in my design work. He went on to say that that's the kind of stuff I battled against my entire career. It looks like the printer designed it, not a professional. Uh, obviously, my love for lowbrow pop culture images that I helped popularize uh, in the 80s uh, postmodern design movement didn't fall within Rand's narrow view of what modern design should be. So I responded by telling him that fighting with printers wasn't my generation's battle, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and that what I liked best about the line art images is that they are iconic, timeless, populist, and sometimes funny. I also like the, the fact that people don't have a degree to relate to them. He abruptly ended the conversation. <laughs> uh, then he turned as he left and told me, next time you're in Connecticut, stop by and I'll buy you an ice cream cone, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so just for a second, I thought this was a, a nice, legitimate invitation until I realized I'd just been ripped by the master <laughs> on his way out. But to this day, I enjoy knowing that the same illustrations that Paul Rand so disliked nearly a quarter of a century ago are still as impactful as when they were first created and alive and well on the CS Images website and uh, being used by designers throughout the world, especially in our favorite category of book covers, like American Rhapsody by Chip Kidd, who used our Plastoc Lips and Death by Suburb, and uh, Cute, Quaint, and Hungry, and love what they did with the type and the sticks with our Plastoc Horse photograph. And of course, Fast Food Nation. And the Frog King and uh, whatever that thing from Japan is. <laughs> this is something that just finished up. Uh, the, the shirts aren't done yet, but it was a threadless CSA images, pretty ugly design challenge. And uh, kind of came up with a name. And Threadless is, a, is this incredible site. They pretty much uh, uh, invented crowdsourcing. Jake Nickel, by accident, started a contest to design a t-shirt for some design conference, I guess it was, had a bunch of people enter and then he thought, well, why should I judge it? Why don't I let the people who entered judge it? And so he did that and found out that they picked the right shirt and that was the shirt that sold. So we kind of kept going with that, having more and more contests and it grew into this uh, uh, really organic, uh, interesting concept and model called Threadless. And uh, so now they do these uh, specific design challenges and I thought it would be interesting uh, to open up CSA images to the Threadless community. And the idea was that you can use up to 10 images from the CSA images, download them for free, and then design your own shirt with them. Because I think, you know, Threadless, I think, you know, sustainability is, is a piece of it. Uh, getting a broader crowd is a big piece of it. And maybe attracting uh, designers that can't illustrate, or writers, or people that have good ideas and can't draw. Uh, so I think, and I think there's a lot of people that, that are like that. Plus, I think asking for illustration is a lot to ask from people. Uh, the, prize, the, the prizes that they give out are you know, more than t-shirt design fees, which are good at least, but, but I thought this could make it more fun, more easy, faster for people to compile stuff, and have less kind of on the line. And uh, this was a test basically for uh, you know, uh, the idea of making CS Images a permanent piece of the Threadless site. So instead of a uh, crowdsourced design challenge site, it becomes a massive product design resource site where people can go in and, uh, and uh, put together their own, their own concepts and their own designs. So. And it worked exactly like I thought, 450 entries, massive amount, uh, amazing quality and diversity of, of stuff, looked like people were having fun, they weren't taking it too seriously, they're doing fun and funny stuff. And I think it kind of meets people halfway or actually 90 or 100% of the way if you use just the images. So this was a, uh, a really interesting experiment. This was the, uh, actually the, 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 the top ranked one, Once Upon a Good Time, which is And these were the images used. It was great that everybody showed the images they used and they showed what they did with them, which was incredible. Couldn't have asked for anything better. And uh, this was I Love You to Pieces. <laughs> I, I think it was I Love You to Pieces, something like that. This is Opposable Opposition. 
using two black and white archive images and then coloring them, they did the hands. Uh, really amazing blend. Perfect gentleman. <laughs> Natural hair. Lucky find. Butterface. <laughs> Would not have thought of that. <laughs> then, of course, uh, family and nest mashed up to become fun for the whole family. <laughs> and, of course, uh, can't forget the uh, fashionable transvestite Bigfoot from outer space. <laughs> and even stranger, nectar of the gods. Not quite sure what that person was thinking of, but that is the, that is the weirdest thing I've ever... I think they, they used all 10, too. I said up to 10, not 10. What were they thinking? I don't know, man. That one makes me very afraid. And then, of course, this one's called Creation Destruction. And uh, I like this one, cheesy whip thrills. I like it because they used uh, actually four images, two word images exactly the way they were, the can, just like it was, and the face, just like it was. And uh, pretty simple, but pretty effective. Then we come to phony face. This is something that we're uh, developing right now. New iPhone app that we're developing. That my, actually, my son Sam came up with it. He just graduated from design school a year ago. He came up with a name, the idea, the logo, uh, a new way to record and send talking animated messages and greetings. Uh, also works with the, uh, with the iPad which then becomes a full face mask. And basically when you talk, it talks too and matches it. And you can say the weirdest things and send them to somebody and it comes up on their phone, which is very <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> and characters like uh, Sarah Tierra and, uh, you know, creepy eyes that blink and move and stare into your soul. A mouth that moves to match your every word. Kind of like collector cards, you know. But uh, this is uh, Roy, Roy Bott. And again, the artwork replicates the look of uh, print, uh, complete with dot screens, misregistration, and paper texture. So it's kind of the look of ink on paper, like the old uh, Topps trading cards. Number of series are all collectible, too. This is Planetary Larry. In addition to the record and sound, there's also a live mode uh, for in-person performance, kind of like a little high-tech ventriloquist dummy, which is even more messed up. <laughs> Some other faces are uh, Witch Hazel, Bulldog, and Chuck L. Clown. In addition to Fluffy Buffy, Harry Mary, and Bill Z. Bub. Also, when you turn the phone on its side, you get the eye and mouth mode. The mouth you can talk through, or record and send, and the eye mode just has all kinds of crazy things going on. There's also a, a touch mode, too, where uh, I think uh, you touch the faces and uh, flames and fire come out of the devil's nose. and uh, uh, all kinds of strange things happen. I think a bird comes out of the uh, mustache, the nest or something there, but anyway. So anyway, that's, that's something we're working on right now in, in developing, and uh, it's kind of a, a, a fun application. It's kind of like, uh, you know, like collectible trading cards from, sent from the future or something. What's cool is when you first pull it up and the mouth is static before you start talking, you know, when you talk, the mouth talks and matches it, or when you get a message, even before the mouth comes up, the eyes blink and they look around. And it's very creepy the way it moves because it's not natural at all, and it's all very flat. It's just, uh, yeah, something very strange about it. But anyway, this is this is what I call the squeezing of design. Some of you might have felt this re recently. Design has finally become uh, acknowledged as a powerful force that can play a key role in helping companies build empires. In light of all this, many designers see becoming their own client and designing their own products as a way forward. Uh, so we like to think of, you know, don't wait for a call from the client. Instead, practice offensive design instead of defensive. Start by taking a look at the world, things you use, the things you love, your interests and hobbies, the products and services you wish were better designed. Redesign something that needs it or invent a new product that you'd like to use. If it's not, on, if it's, if it's not an online product, make sure it has an online component. Name it, brand it, trademark it, prototype it in reality. Designers need to move ahead of corporate clients and focus and focus groups and start designing things that people don't even realize they need yet. Design great stuff, manufacture great stuff, sell great stuff, or better yet, license great stuff. Because you gotta be a little bit careful. If you ever had a whole uh, 
giant dumpster full of products that didn't sell that you had to throw away, tens of thousands of dollars, you become very, very cautious about uh, how it works. And uh, the pipeline is more, is more important than the product itself. Here's the product, the biggest idea in the world. Here's the consumer or the stores. Here's the pipeline distribution. This can be total crap. And if you have this down, it will flow. So the pipeline starts first. Everybody starts with a great idea first. Everybody starts with a great product first. The pipeline of how it gets out first. Like the pipeline for the phony face thing is that, uh, you know, a couple of them are free. And then that gets the word spread, hopefully, and then people start to tap into that. So the, the pipeline has to be built into every idea. Uh, otherwise, it'll never get an exposure. Or license it. We just uh, signed a deal with Shutterfly uh, on their new treat card site to license the entire 50,000 image archive, opened it up to their 100 in-house designers to make cards out of, which would be pretty cool. Because we don't want to design the cards ourselves. It's way too many cards, but letting them use the, uh, the images is, uh, is kind of a new, a new way to go and another way to, to get the things out. So I think the, uh, yeah, that's what we view design as art for commerce. I think to end this, I'm going to show this, uh, this video. It's called The Control Master. It's uh, by Run Rake, this British animator who's pretty incredibly talented. He did it uh, with beer. He, he used all CS images in this thing and tried to use all 50,000 of them jammed in here. So I, I hope you find it as uh, delightful and disturbing as I do. But I'll let this run. Let's see if this will work.
Anybody have any questions?